Okay, we've got a couple more people joining us. I think I'll get started about now. That poll should be visible to everybody that's just logged in now as well. We've got two questions on the poll just to get an idea of who's in the audience and what kind of things you're interested in. Um, and I can see some good answers coming in now. Thanks, everyone. So um, we've only got a, a pretty short session today, so I'll get started. Um, I'll introduce myself first. I introduced myself in the chat and feel free to do so yourselves as well. My name's Lizzie Lowe and I am an extension scientist at CESAR Australia and I'm going to be running the Pest Facts Southeastern Early um, Season webinar for today. And we've actually got a, uh, a couple of different sessions. We're starting today with our looking forward, looking back session to kind of have a bit of a conversation about what we saw last year and what it might mean for this year. And we've got two more sessions coming up too. We've got some really interesting research updates for you next week. And then we're hoping to have kind of a, a discussion about what kind of resources we use and what's important for us with the industry coming up. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar with pest facts, we are primarily um, around to help growers and, and advisors to keep informed about the kind of pests that they're seeing and the best ways that they can deal with them. And we mostly deal with um, Victoria and Southern New South Wales. And we are part of the IPM for Grains project and that's funded by the GRDC and some of our wonderful research partners, uh, which is DPIRD, SADI, QDAF and New South Wales DPI. So today, um, just a couple of things to get started. As I said, there's a couple of people that have been introducing yourselves via the chat. That's wonderful. We'd really love to know who's here and what kind of interests you have. There's a Zoom poll as well, which um, you can select your answers for. And we'd love it if you use the chat as a chance to ask questions that we can follow up on at the end of the um, session. We are set to run for about half an hour, but we will have the opportunity to stay on longer if people wanted to have more um, long discussions and this session is being recorded for people that weren't able to make it today. So as I said, this is as much about us getting to know you as it is you getting to know us and the researchers at CESAR. And so when you registered, I got a little bit of information from you. So I thought you might like to know who's coming along. We've got a split between early and late career um, uh, people that have come on board and lots of agronomists, which is wonderful to see, some technical coordinators and officers, a couple of salespeople, some farmers, it's really wonderful to have you here and research scientists and managers as well. So that's kind of the breakdown of the community that we've got on board today. And when I asked you about the kind of things that you wanted to hear about, I, these are the kind of um, answers that I got, lots of armyworm, aphids, full armyworm, red-legged earth mite, and I'm hoping that we can answer some of these questions for you and cover some of these topics over the next three weeks. So the wonderful speakers that we have online today are Jess at the top, who will be starting with our reporting from 2020, what we saw and a little bit about what we might see for armyworm. We've got James on board, who will be talking about Russian wheat aphid, and Leo, who's gonna give us a refresher on identifying Lepidopteran pests. So we'll start off with Jess. I'm just going to let her share the screen and Jess, you should be able to Great, thanks Lizzie. Looks like it's working. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. This will be a bit of a speed session um, today. So um, just as an overview of 2020, um, it will probably come as, as no surprise given we had a pretty wet mild conditions last autumn and winter. This is quite a bu busy year um, in terms of inver invertebrate reporting and invertebrate ID requests that came into CESAR Australia. Um, here on the, the graph on the right, I'm showing data for Southeastern Australia in terms of invertebrate reports. And this included um, reporting to SARDI's PestFax um, Australia service, as well as our PestFax Southeastern service. So they're amalgamated. And you can see the majority of reporting that we received for um, pests and also beneficials uh, was from the May to August period. So that covered the establishment period and the lead up to flowering. <clears throat> Here is um, a breakdown of pest categories from the reports that we received last year. Uh, it will come as no surprise that out of um, the aphid category, Russian wheat aphid was still very commonly reported. Um, and uh, although from, from our discussions with those making the reports, it sounds like confidence um, in how to ID it has certainly grown over time, which is great to see. Uh, not surprisingly, red-legged earth mite was commonly um, reported around May-June, 
So that's not to say that that is when it's most abundant, but more likely when people are keeping an eye out for it um, on young, young plants. Sorry, just slide. <laughs> um, there we go. Oh, just a couple back. You've got it oh, thank you. Here we go. Um, from beetles, um, yellow-headed pasture cockchafer was um, the most commonly reported beetles, but we didn't get a high number of beetle reports and we had a few weevil reports. I suppose um, most notably in 2020 was the very high number of um, Lepidoptera ID requests that we received and reports overall. So um, we had over 18 different taxa logged in our database, which is a very high number in comparison to previous years. Um, also during autumn of last year, we especially received a, a large number of weed web moth and cabbage center grub reports um, throughout the autumn period, which Leo is going to cover in a little more detail in, in terms of ID. Um, probably the most standout category of reports and ID requests was armyworm, um, which in this data set I've presented here doesn't include um, any full armyworm reports, only um, native armyworm species. So here is a comparison of armyworm reports since uh, 2006. Um, so in the lead up to 2006 from the 80s, actually armyworm reports were on the decline and then they started to increase again. Um, and you will also note, however, subscribership to the service had gone up over the period since 2006 too. Um, you can see a drop in 2018, that's likely due to um, quite dry conditions, um, but then we have a spike in 2020. So according to um, reports that we received, um, in several cases, although um, certainly not all cases, there was a high amount of defoliation um, observed in, in autumn and, and also in winter and large populations were observed. Um, this is particularly true in the Loddon Mallee and Eastern Wimmera regions. Um, but there were a lot of cases where no damage um, or very little damage was evident. You can see in the picture I've presented here, um, this is a picture of late instar larvae climbing stalks in the Eastern Wimmera. In this case, um, it was reported that they were um, showing marching behavior as well. Um, and that happens when populations grow quickly and they become stressed and, and run low on a food source. Um, as another example, last year, there was a situation where about half a hectare of wheat um, around growth stage 29, were observed where plants had no leaf remaining, only stem remaining, um, and there were estimated to be over 50 larvae per square metre in the most damaged parts of the paddock, um, but this was uh, an extreme case. Okay, so you can see just a few maps here over the last few years. I've just shown armyworm reports here and amalgamator reports on the bottom right from 2018 to 2020. And you can see there've been clusters of reports in North Central Vic um, in 2020. Um, and specifically, as I said, Loddon Mallee and Eastern Wimmera regions um, of, of Vic. So with this in mind, um, let's take a look at native armyworm species that you would find in Southeastern Australia and, and have a bit of a look at the conditions that will drive their populations. So just a reminder that armyworm is a catch-all name for a few different species um, of, of caterpillar. Um, and there are different um, differences in these species, particularly in relation to their cold tolerance. Um, and this affects when we are likely to observe different species of, of armyworm. So of note, um, for the next few months in southeastern Australia, southern inland and common armyworm species, which are all migratory species, um, are likely to be found over the course of the year. Um, however, it's the inland and southern armyworm species that are more likely to be found in um, Victoria rather than New South Wales, so in cooler climates. This is because southern armyworm um, and inland armyworms are more cold tolerant than common armyworm. Um, and that's more likely to be found in New South Wales um, over the winter months with flights into Vic in, in spring. So we know from past work that development of southern armyworm um, slows down over the cooler months um, in Vic and this helps them to survive those months. Um, and if populations migrate into crops in autumn and if conditions are especially mild as we saw last year, they can even undergo up to two generations from autumn to spring. So 
Um, common armyworm um, in comparison tends not to be um, abundant in um, Victoria until spring when the weather um, warms up a little and, and can support those immigrating moth um, populations. So from a management perspective, you don't necessarily need to distinguish um, these different armyworm species, um, but, uh, and their developmental rates are quite similar, but it's useful to be aware that at least one type of um, native armyworm species can survive the colder months in Vic. Um, beet, false and full armyworm species, there are other species to keep in mind. They have a higher thermal um, threshold for development. So we wouldn't expect to find these in winter and spring. Um, in, in cropping regions um, in South e southeastern Australia. Um, we know from, um, he, from Australia and overseas that um, armyworm species are very good at explo exploiting um, post drought conditions. Um, so this is when rainfall is encouraging um, growth, um, but also when natural enemy populations haven't had time to recover from stress tr stressful conditions. Um, so therefore, fast develop, developing populations of, of armyworm are favoured, they can outcompete those, those natural enemies. So um, those three species of armyworm that I mentioned, common southern and inland, um, they're migratory um, and they can move quite short distances. That can be 10, 10 kilometres to hundreds of kilometres. Um, but they can also employ a very useful strategy where um, they can move very high up into the atmosphere and take advantage of low pressure systems. Um, and these low pressure systems can transport them even thousands of kilometers um, from their starting point. And when they're dropped by these low pressure systems, this weather system is often accompanied by rainfall. And that means that when um, moths lay their eggs um, where they are dropped um, and those eggs hatch. Um, early instar larvae often have new growth um, to feed on and populations can really take off. So we've had questions over the years about preference for laying in stubble versus green growth um, for armyworm. Um, and several reports in 2020 did note that armyworm had been found in paddocks um, often barley paddocks with high stubble loads. Um, and yes, this is an area that has been researched, um, um, particularly for common armyworm. And studies have shown that a green grass pasture um, with a dried grass component um, had more larvae than a pasture with just green grass. So this is uh, an egg laying preference and it helps to explain why larger larval populations are also often found in stubble retained paddocks. So what is the perfect scenario for an armyworm um, outbreak? Um, firstly, there need to be adequate populations um, in source areas from where they're migrating. So that needs to be supported by um, good inland um, rainfall, particularly in autumn. There needs to be suitable atmospheric conditions for long range moth migration. So those low pressure systems that can transport them to cropping regions. And um, there also needs to be rainfall within a short time frame of those moths immigrating into a region and laying their eggs. So they, they, this is a recipe for an armyworm outbreak, but coupled with that, if it's a post drought year, they also have a, a competitive advantage because natural enemies haven't necessarily recovered um, from those stressful conditions. So when we think about uh, 2020, it was post drought. Um, we had very mild uh, conditions, um, both in regions where armyworm immigrated into, but their um, origin um, areas as well, where they migrated from. And we had above average rainfall um, in those regions as well across um, autumn to spring. Um, and so that combination of environmental factors is likely to have supported um, breeding of native armyworm um, populations in those more arid inland regions where they originate from, as well as survival in cropping areas where, um, where they flew to or were transported to. So when we consider 2021, um, according to the outlook, it's likely to be a mild, um, mild conditions in the lead up to June. So similar to last year, but there's likely to be less rainfall in comparison to 2020. So that will be a little less fa favorable to armyworm. But it's also important to remember that natural enemies have had favorable conditions over the last 12 months that will, would have helped them to recover as well. So over the next few months, keep, um, keep an eye out for 
um, armyworm species. Let us know if you find any so we can send out a pest fax uh, notification. And also keep an eye out for beneficial species um, that could help um, suppress those populations. So here's a couple of indicators um, that you might have um, some natural enemies um, in your paddock. Um, I've shown, uh, I'm showing a photo here of the eggs of the spine predatory um, shield bug. Um, they look quite distinctive. You can see that they have these eyelash structures on, on the rim of the eggs. Um, you might also see parasitoid wasp um, pupae um, in the paddock and they can be found um, as those furry clusters that are shown on the bottom right of the screen um, where pupation has occurred um, after the wasp larvae have ruptured out of the caterpillar, which is shown on the, on the top right there. So just keep an eye out for those indicators that you have a bit of that activity in your paddocks. Um, I'll leave that there, Lizzie. Thanks so much, Jess. Uh, just transferring this over to James. Uh, here we go. Uh, all right, hopefully I have control over that. Um, thanks for coming everyone today. Um, today I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the research um, that emerged out of a uh, recent project led by Martin Van Helden from Saudi in which I was involved. Um, so the, the project aimed to address a few key knowledge gaps, gaps for the Australian grains industry surrounding Russian wheat aphid, um, namely, you know, how Russian wheat aphid um, utilizes the green bridge um, and also you know some management rec recommendations to really I, I guess guide when um, management intervention is is going to be cost effective so that was uh, basically resulted in the development of an economic threshold calculator but just as a quick refresher um, hopefully we're all very familiar with how to actually id russian wheat aphid um, We've got the short antennae, the small exhaust pipes at the end of the aphid and the double tail. Uh, and of course, these characteristic symptoms, but just important to note that these are not uh, symptoms that you will see in weeds. So um, really good that we manually just have a quick check of uh, barley grass, which is a favored weed of this pest um, as confirmed by the uh, field surveys that we conducted as part of this project. Now I'm trying to change the screen let's see here we go <laughs> there we go so how do we uh, target our monitoring we understand that um growers and agronomists have limited time so it's probably good that we focus on the favored host plants which include volunteer cereals barley grass and and brome grasses these overwhelmingly emerged as the favored host plants through uh, the field surveys conducted as part of this project but they can also be found on other host plants like wild oat and and phalaris it's also important to acknowledge that the green bridge is not only utilized by uh, pest aphids, but also an array of other invertebrates, including parasitoid wasps, ladybirds and lacewings. So when we're monitoring for Russians, it's important that we also check that there are um, beneficial populations around too, which will be impacted by any uh, chemical controls that we put out. But we can further target our monitoring by having an understanding of you know, where is the climate most suitable for uh, Russian wheat aphid uh, refuges over that Greenbridge period. And that's exactly what we did um, through this investment. We had a look at basically the occurrence of Russian wheat aphid across this Greenbridge period in 2018 to 2019. Um, most of them were absences. It was a pretty dry time, if you all remember. Um, but there were some occurrence records or positive occurrence records here in red, which overlay quite nicely with um, the risk map, which is developed from uh, the temperature and soil moisture conditions across that um, period from October to April. And if we compare, compare that with subsequent years, we see that in that 2019 to 2020 Greenbridge period, um, we expected a bit of a, a more favorable conditions. Um, and compare that to this year, we see even more favorable conditions again. So this was somewhat supported by the reports that we had last year, which were, uh, I guess, higher than the reports we had in the 2018 to 2019 period. So if, if that follows, we might expect that there'll be 
uh, further reports uh, in uh, this current year, uh, particularly in these northern regions where we've had a lot of uh, summer rain. But as Jess mentioned, it has been uh, a little bit drier leading up into uh, uh, sowing. And of course, just because the climatic conditions are more favourable, there's still a, a range of or a sequence of events that needs to take place for, for the Russian wheat aphid to establish in crop. So it has to build up in the crop in you know, emerging and growing uh, crops. And before that, it has to migrate into crops. Before that, it actually has to persist over that Greenbridge period. And before that, it has to get into non-crop uh, host plants through which it can persist that Greenbridge period. And before that, the Russian wheat aphid has to be in high enough numbers that, that its you know, populations are quite high and they can disperse widely across the region and fill those little refuges across the low landscape. So quite a, a long sequence of events that needs to occur for that risk to build up and, and suitable climate is just one part of that. But the good news is that we have time to act because of these clear symptoms that do develop within cereals, which allow us to fairly readily quantify the percentage of tillers with aphids and use the new Russian wheat aphid threshold calculator to decide the cost benefit of intervention. So I'm gonna quickly whiz through the calculator now, um, but as this sort of pertains mostly to around that um, period around growth stage 30, where we are trying to decide those um, applications, uh, we will be uh, having further, I guess, updates throughout the season and refreshes on how to use this uh, threshold. But it's good to just quickly go through it now so that we become more familiar with the tools that we have available. So as you can see, there's a range of uh, options to select things from the cost of the actual control um, application to the cereal market price currently, uh, the yield potential of the particular variety and the region in which you're growing. Uh, and the approximate time until head emergence from the date that you've actually observed Russian wheat aphid in your field. And of course, the most importantly, we have the actual um, occurrence of Russian wheat aphid or density of Russian wheat aphid that you're observing in your cr crop. And this uh, requires a bit of standardized sampling to give us a good estimate. Although acknowledging again, that uh, growers and agronomists don't have unlimited time. So we have to do this efficiently. So what we've recommended is to get a, a decent distribution across the paddock to follow a W uh, shape and take at least samples from at least five sections of the paddock. So you'd wanna observe the total number of tillers um, in, a, in a row, for example, and what proportion of those um, tillers actually have symptoms. So in this case, the red tillers, are the, the, that we have two tillers with symptoms, but it's important to note that um, not all tillers with symptoms will have Russian wheat aphid. Sometimes the populations within those tillers will have collapsed um, due to unfavorable conditions or, or even due to uh, uh, beneficial invertebrates controlling populations. But it does allow us to sort of focus on those uh, tillers with symptoms and then confirm whether or not Russian wheat aphid uh, are, are present. So we can put all of that together. Uh, so basically multiplying the proportion uh, of aphids with tillers with the proportion of tillers with symptoms. And in this case, we get an estimate of 10% of uh, observed tillers with Russian wheat aphid. Plug that into the calculator and it essentially spits out the action threshold or the point at which uh, intervening uh, is going to be cost effective so that we're not just wasting um, you know, our, our management um, and controls. So I'll leave it at there uh, and hand on to Leo. Okay. Um, do I have, yes, click to start remote control. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, James. So um, I'm just going to take you through some lepidopteran ID identifications, a refresher. So as Jess mentioned earlier, we had quite a number of reports um, early in the season last year of weed web moth and cabbage center grub. And this year we've also had some reports already uh, in, in March and early April of these pests. And I'll also take you through some identification features of armyworm and I'll touch at the end on fall armyworm. So, yeah, okay, I think I, yeah, there we go. So the weed web mop, this is a, a native species to Australia. It's, um, 
a slender and hairy caterpillar with a black head capsule. You can see some hairs uh, coming off the side of it here in this image. It has a distinctive dark stripe down the middle of their back. And it, it, it varies in color like, like many caterpillars do. And it varies in color from gray green, dark green and pale green. And a, kind of a distinguishing characteristic of this species is it has three rows of uh, dark spots on each side of the body. Um, the larvae are usually small, growing between uh, from about 15 millimeters in size. However, last year we did have reports of some larvae growing larger to 20 millimeters and even 35 millimeters in size. And it feeds on a variety of crops such as canola, lucerne, medic, soybean, cotton, and some broadleaf weeds. A uh, behavioral characteristic that's quite distinctive for this species is, is it wriggles quite violently when it's disturbed and, and the larvae also kind of are quite active um, when they're crawling along the plant. And it, as the name would suggest, it spins a web that, that can bind leaves together. You can see the lucerne in this plant is, is quite stuck together with the web that it spins. And this is often noticed before the caterpillars themselves. The caterpillars are uh, use their chewing med parts to kind of skeletonize uh, foliage and in severe infestations, they can uh, completely defoliate um, crops. So cabbage center grub now. Um, in Australia, there's two species of cabbage center grub. Uh, one is native and one is introduced. Uh, the native species is found throughout all of Australia, while the introduced species is um, found in Northern um, Australia and Eastern Australia, but not below Southern New South Wales. However, it's difficult to tell these species apart in in the field and their management um, and their behavior is similar that um, it's not necessary to identify to a species level in the paddock. So they're cream colored uh, larvae and they also have a dark head capsule. They do have distinctive red and brown longitudinal stripes that run along their back uh, and their body. You can see this from the dorsal image here and in this image, you can also see these stripes on the side of the body. Uh, the larvae are usually small, growing to 15 millimeters in size, and they feed on brassica crops such as canola. Now, when they feed, they, they tend to actually bore into growing points um, on the plant and also bore into leaf veins. You can see this picture on the right here where they're actually within the leaf itself. And they produce, like the weed web moth, uh, a, a distinctive webbing and that can bind the plants and uh, the crop and the leaves together. So I'll just touch on armyworm now. Jess mentioned earlier that armyworm is a kind of a catch-all term for um, related moth species um, in Australia. And the, the three main armyworm that I'm gonna focus on just in this section is common armyworm, southern armyworm and inland armyworm. So armyworm species, um, they have smooth bodies with, with, with few sparse hairs. And the body varies in color from green, yellow, and even brown. Uh, they have quite distinct long, three longitudinal stripes that run from the color right behind their head uh, down along their body. Now these stripes aren't always very prominent on the body, but the color behind the head will always have three stripes. The larvae grow from one millimeter in size up to 40 millimeters and there is usually six larval stages, sometimes seven. They feed on um, cereals and, and, and pastures uh, with barley, oats and rice being most susceptible to their damage. They lay their eggs as Jess mentioned in dry grasses and, and cereal stubble and the common army worm generally migrates into, um, into paddocks in winter and, and late spring and will be present then from spring and summertime. And southern and inland army worm are present during the autumn and winter. And in cooler regions, they can sometimes persist into spring as well. Army worm are generally nocturnal feeders. And during the day, you'll often find um, them curled up on the soil below the plant. However, as you can see in this image here, they sometimes feed on uh, lower leaves and stems during the day as well. 
So I'll just touch briefly on fall army worm now. So I'm sure you're all aware that this was is an exotic species that was detected um, in Queensland in February 2020, and it has been found since in various areas of Queensland, New South Wales, and even in Victoria. Um, it's classed as eradicable now at this stage. And just to touch on some of its distinguishing features, it has some stout hairs that can be seen uh, on the raised spots that, that cover the, the body. Um, the, the arrangement of spots on the midsection of the body are usually in a, in a trapeze shape. And probably most distinctly, um, the most distinct feature for, for this uh, uh, caterpillar is that it has four raised spots in a square shape on the second to last body segment. And then it has four raised spots in a trapeze shape on the last body segment. And it also has an inverted Y shape on its head. It a, has a very wide host range, including maize, sweet corn, rice, cotton, sugarcane, and uh, many horticultural plant species as well. So if you do find um, a caterpillar in your, in your paddock and you suspect it's fall army worm, uh, there is, a, you can obviously contact us and we can try help with identification. And there is a, a form um, on the Vic, uh, AgVic website where you can actually report this. I'll, I'll actually post the link for that into the chat. Uh, just now, um, and you can report it if you suspect it could be fall army worm. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Leo. Um, and as all of our speakers have kind of mentioned today, we do rely on reports from agronomists and people who are out in the field <coughs> to keep us updated about what's going on. So if you do see something that's interesting or that you'd like an identification for, um, these are the different ways that you can report to us. Um, and we'd love to hear from you about any kind of pest problems that you're having or any beneficials that you're seeing in your um, crops as well. Um, if you're not already joined up to our newsletter as well, there's a link there for how you can join our newsletter. And we often send out updates uh, about the kind of pests that people are seeing in their fields and what kind of things we can do about them. So um, this was week one of our three week series. And um, next week we'll be having a more in deep um, in depth discussion about fall armyworm and what we're seeing in Australia at the moment. We're going to talk about blue green aphid control and insecticide resistance in mites um, uh, and an, an ID refresher for mites as well. Now, I do realize we have gone past our 12.30 um, point. We, I haven't got any questions in the chat yet, but if you are interested in sticking around, then our speakers will be here to answer questions and you're very welcome to kind of just speak up or to write something into the chat. Um, uh, I'm just having a quick look in the poll. I can I can tell people about everybody loves ladybirds. That's really nice to see. The polling um, results should come to you guys as well if you're interested to see what kind of um, answers that other people have given as well. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming along today. Um, it's been really, really nice to see so many people that have logged on online and I'm really hoping that we can work together, hear more from you about what you're seeing and to, to provide you with information that's useful for you into the future as well. So you're welcome to stay online if you have any more questions. Thanks everyone. I didn't see any more in the chat. There wasn't anything I missed, was there? Yes, so David asked about redhead cockchafer and we're actually working on that at the moment. So we have had a couple of reports come through. Um, we will have an article that comes out through our newsletter by the end of the week. And we could possibly include um, some information about that in our session next week as well. David, hopefully um, we'll, we'll provide an update with the information that we get throughout this week. Okay, I think that might be it. Um, this will be recorded and can be released to anybody who wants uh, any extra information or wants to have a look over the slides again. And if you have any colleagues that didn't weren't able to make it today, then we are able to provide them with that recording as well. So um, thanks very much, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you.